Well, I'm gonna let you partake in that one. Perks of my job is uh, why I call it whiskey and wood because I get to drink at work now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Paul Grenier. This is Whiskey and Wood, bringing the people, the stories, and the success to you. This is a multi billion dollar industry. And these guys and gals are out to get a piece of it. Why whiskey and wood? Why not? Uh, we are so everybody. Thank you for joining uh, another episode of Whiskey and Wood. We are sitting down with Joseph Davis of DCW Hardwood. Hello, and- Joey. Joey, all right. Uh, Joey Davis of DCW Hardwood in South Carolina, and we're gonna hear your story. And you know, so you're a furniture maker. Uh, you sell slabs, you sell lumber, and uh, you make some pretty cool stuff. So, how did this all start for you? Uh, well, you know, like a lot of people, I've been doing what I had to do for a living for a long time. And uh, furniture has been a passion, you know, making woodworking has been a passion for quite a long time. I think I started woodworking about maybe 16, you know, almost 18 years ago. And uh, I was doing it as a hobby and then whatever reason, it, it worked for me. I do, I was able to do it and do it well. Um, and I did it for a number of years and then I got divorced. I sold everything for a little while. And then um, later on, a few years down the road, I had a, a pest control business, if you can believe that I started in 08. <laughs> after everything went to, you know what, and um, I had started that out of necessity, and then after about, you know, 10, 11 years of it, I was just like, you know, I'm done with this, I never wanted to be a bug man, yeah. um, and uh, I was like, you know, I think I'm going to get back into doing something I want to do, and like I said, I've been doing what I had to do most of my life, so I decided, I was like, you know, this time I'm going to do what I want to do, so I started this business in a 25 by 50 industrial park storage unit, uh, just doing furniture. And then I ended up, ended up expanding about six months later into the unit next to me. So I had 50 by 50. And mostly that was to set up a spray booth and to store wood. Um, and what I kept finding in my area is that there was just really nobody who sold wood here. Uh, yeah. you know, South Carolina and the beach area isn't as big of a you know woodworking area, say Pennsylvania or something like that. Um, and so anyways, I did it for a while. I was doing very well, doing some customer projects. Things were uh, growing. And um, to the point where I wanted to move to a bigger shop. So I found another shop um, down the road. It was probably about uh, twice that size with a little bit of land on it. And um, I wanted to expand and start cutting some of my own stuff because I was just having a hard time finding big slabs and one piece stuff and things of that nature. So um, I went and moved to that new location. Well, as you can imagine, setting up a shop takes a little bit of time, especially when you're kind of a one man show. Um, and so I was shut down for about a month and a half, setting up this new place, putting the electro- electrical and dust collection and getting everything moved around and set up and moved over. It was a lot of stuff. And uh, I started selling some of my lumber to pay the bills. <laughs> and uh, what I kept hearing from people on Facebook and Craigslist were, you know, hey, man, I'm, that's so cool. Somebody around here has finally got some wood. And I saw, you know, I heard that over and over again. So I thought I was like, you know, there's a hole in the market here. Yeah. And so when I was making custom orders, I would order twice as much wood and all my profit. And I was putting a lot of my profit into just getting stock. And so um, I just kept building my inventory and having more and more wood available. Uh, and then I bought a Lucas mill and uh, started uh, cutting a lot of the trees and stuff that people were cutting here and throwing away from tree services and things like that. A lot of urban reclaimed lumber. Yep. And um, I took, and then I ended up working with a guy who had an eye dry kiln actually uh, in Virginia. And so his, uh, stepfather lived here and he, he would make trips there and drive my wood for me. And, uh, that was going for, well, for a little while until the guy decided he was going to do something different. And he started not, I don't know, he was not drawing the wood very right. Good. I was getting case hardening and some issues like that. Cause he was trying to rush things. Yeah. Um, so I quit using him and, uh, eventually I ended up buying my own eye dry kiln actually from, uh, you guys. I have uh, a iDrive Plus that was we've been using now for three, four, three, four years, maybe. I don't know, four, yeah, five years. it's been That's quite a while. Three or four years. And uh, it's been working really, really well. So that enabled me to cut my own. 
stuff and get it dried and have my and control my process, which was a big problem is I, you know, be running out, you know, you can't sell from empty basket. Yep. So if you don't have any wood to sell and you can't really go out there and buy slabs mm-hmm. very much, very easily. If you do, you know, it's usually a premium price on them. So that was really hard for a small shop like I was. And so I ended up buying another mill. Uh, I got a, a, a Lucas, a wood miser, I'm sorry, uh, LT15 wide, because it's a lot faster than a Lucas mill. I can tell you, a Lucas mill is <laughs> a lot of work. Yeah. It's basically a glorified Alaskan mill. Yeah, but, uh, but it's, you know, it's got a 76 inch cut. So for these big, big trees that we get here, like these oak trees and pecan trees we get in our area, you know, that's about the only thing that's really going to cut it. So it was really ends up, ended up with me having one of the biggest mills in four hours and eight, five hours in a direction in the area that could handle big stuff. And a lot of these tree servers and people were happy to find someone who could do something with it. So I had bought a 36 foot gooseneck with a hydraulic dovetail. It had a 30,000 pound winch in the front with a log arbor on top. And I was going and winching these big logs <laughs> up the trailer for a little while. And then I got a bobcat and was doing that. And then um, eventually I bought a, knuckle, a used knuckle boom truck with a 12 ton lift. I was using that and sold all that stuff. I got one to an old commercial truck. Actually, I just sold that because I'm not really doing that much anymore. So now I just, I've figured out that just paying somebody a few hundred dollars extra to have them bring the wood to you is a better deal than trying to do all the work yourself. Yeah. Save you some time for sure. Yeah. So over, um, so I stayed at that location for a little while for about two years and I'll grow quickly. And so I'm at my current location now, which is on an acre where about an 8,000 square foot facility and I have uh, eight employees wow. uh, two for six, uh, over six years. Um, and we're doing, I don't know, probably close to about a million a year right now. And that's in combination of lumber sales and uh, you know custom work, yeah, and custom work being a lion's share. And what I started doing about three years ago is I actually started making trips internationally to South America and going to sawmills and purchasing wood and then aggregating it all into containers and bringing it back. Oh, wow. Selling exotic wood, I'm going to pick it out myself. Um, selling regional wood, that I'm urban reclaimed lumber, and you know sinker wood that people are pulling out. We're cutting that ourselves. We're, we cut a lot of beams and uh, slabs here. I don't cut any dimensional lumber. I don't have hydraulic mills, so we're not. Yeah. To make any sense to try to do that stuff without hydraulics, but um, and we're, so we do a lot of custom mantles. We do a lot of custom tables and countertops and surfaces, t- custom table legs, furniture. Um, I do. I do like Maloof chairs and things of that nature. I do uh, gut rooms, wine cellars commercial residential work uh you know really a we're pretty much the the main shop in this area now for custom work that's all awesome. very quickly and um we just actually actually added a cnc machine we got a um a uh um what's it called uh, uh a digital wood carver oh cool yeah so we got a 5100 machine with a fourth access and a laser and all that stuff so we're playing with that now and doing some laser work um <laughs> We've upgraded our, we've got a nice 30 by 15 spray booth now that we our spray our finishes with, and we're using um, uh, a UV cured resin from, um, um, uh, what is it called, a blue, um, uh, uh, I can't, I'm drawing a blank on what it's called, but I'll give you, give me a minute I, here. Uh, I saw, uh, so that UV cured resin, I saw, I interviewed um, Blacktail Studio. Same stuff. <clears throat> yeah, and I saw he was, you know, I watched some of his videos and saw Blue that. Blue Cure SC. What's that? Blue Cure SC is the website, but it's okay. Uh, stuff's fantastic. It hardens super quick, and it's like yeah, it's great. Um, hold on one second. Uh, that's that's for the uh, clothes up there for donation. Right up here, CJM. There's a box of clothes right there for donations for her, for them. Sorry, we're donating a bunch of stuff for the uh, people in um, uh, in in the North Carolina mountains. Yeah, yeah, so that's uh, clothes and stuff here. We're donating all that stuff so the people here can pick that up. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a sad story. So I'm glad you guys yeah. can help them. It's it's sad on many levels, and all the wood that's getting wasted out of there is beautiful yeah. stuff. A friend of mine runs a tree service. He's up there doing work right now, and he's a man. You it'd break your heart to see the stuff we're having to throw away. <laughs> yeah, it's uh. It's crazy. Even without that storm, how much of this wood gets thrown away or doesn't get used properly? It's uh, sad. And that's, a, that's been a big boon for us because, uh, you know, when I started this business in COVID-19, 
And, um, you know, luckily all the people that were sitting around, you know, they weren't able to do nothing. All these people were going out and doing stuff and they weren't really home a lot to do projects. Well, now they're all sitting at their house and yeah, well, looking around like, well, you know what? This place sucks. I got to fix that. I got to do this. I'm going to do that was... project. And so our lumber sales just took off. Yeah. And that's the work we were doing. Um, and all those people who are hobbies were sitting home with nothing to do. So they started woodworking. Yeah. COVID so that really work. helped propel me uh, in the business to where we are now. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, you know, I've got a, almost a million dollars worth of lumber sitting in our yard here. That's crazy. Um, but yeah, the blue, but the uh, UV cure resin stuff is great. Um, you know, I can finish a, a 10 foot table on both sides with, you know, seal coats and top coats, seven or eight hours. Yeah. That's, it's wild. Now, are you guys doing any stock pieces like standard? They can order this one type of furniture and you ship it or is everything just custom right now? Um, so I have thought about doing that. So with the slabs, it's really hard to do that because every slab is unique. Yeah. Um, I might buy a flitch and there's, you know, eight or 10 pieces or eight, eight slabs in that. So, yeah, I mean, it is tough with live edge stuff because everything's unique, but I like, I've been urging more people out there who are in the live edge business to develop relationships with wholesalers and start stocking some regular dimensional type stuff because that'll bring in contractors and some repeat yeah. business. And even if you're getting a, a little bit of a margin on that. I, I feel like that will help eventually sell some of your slabs and your more unique pieces. So I well, thought about that for sure. And I've, I've attempted to do it though. What we've been running into instead, uh, we've found such a niche. Um, we haven't had time. Uh, yeah. I mean, literally, you know, it's kind of like if you've ever been to pick out a granite, if it's, you, I mean, people come in, we walk them back, we show them, you know, all the inventory. Yeah. And they pick out a piece they like, it's the size they need. And, you know, suits their, whatever their flavor is. Yeah. And then we go through the process of customizing that and what kind of base they want, so on and so forth. And they pick out their piece. And yeah. if that's not in their budget, they want a different look that we go to, we have sample boards of all the dimensional lumber we carry. We carry about 45 species. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's really like going into a flooring place almost with all the swatches and everything. And they go and they pick out exactly what they want and customize it. And we build it and, you know, we stay a steady two months out on work, Oh, nice. um, you know, and we're doing pretty high volume and I, we tried to, I've tried to have products, but, you know, my showroom is only, not only, but I mean, it's 65, uh, excuse me, 60 by 35 and between the stuff that's going out, we're already making um, and just a few pieces I have in there. I, I just don't have room to even uh, stock it. Um, well, that's a good it's, problem. It's, it, it, it would definitely be something we want to do, but at this point I have to rent out another warehouse just to have space to store the product. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we're, um, and we do do some shipping and stuff, but most of our clientele is with a three or four hour radius. Um, and they're, they're coming here and they are, most of them already know what they want. They've already researched us. Um, and, you know, we're just banging it out as fast as we can get it. Um, so, I mean, I thought I was going to have to do that. I was looking to come up with a product line. That's kind of why I've also got the CNC machine is so I could do some repeatable stuff. Yep. Not having to sit and babysit it. Um, but so far that actually hasn't come to fruition because now I've got people coming in. I got, he made his own table and now he wants, uh, you know, this circular design with Italian words written in it, with initials of all his family. And he drew it out. I plugged it into Venture Conspire and, got it all set up and I just printed out or cut out a test piece for him. And once it's right, I'm going to lay it into his, uh, um, into his table. And another customer came in uh, with a boat, petite boat table and he has a YouTube channel and he wanted the name of the boat put in in resin in it. I think it was called liquid asset carved in cursive into it. So we use a CNC machine for that. So we're just doing a lot of, you know, that's crazy. How do these people find you and know what you do? It's like such a niche thing. Like, is it word? Uh, what I've found is, is that so almost every builder in town knows who we are now. Um, okay. Almost every tree service in town knows who we are now. And we are, I think, the top four or five destination, move to destination in the United States right now, Myrtle Beach, because ever since COVID, people could work remotely and plus yeah. retiring. And Myrtle Beach is already a popular destination anyways. Um, yeah. So a lot of them are just retiring here because it's cheaper than the Northeast. It's half the cost of, of 
owning a home half a, uh, less than half of the cost of the taxes. You know, yeah. they're going to own a house here for a couple grand a year for taxes versus ten oh. thousand a year. Yeah, talk to me up here, and we're in Vermont and New Hampshire. It's crazy up here. Yeah. So, so, and so it's making it very attractive. So all these people are coming down here. They're buying cookie cutter houses, and they want their unique stuff. They want a beautiful countertop. They want a mantle that's not crown molding and a piece of pine. Yeah. Um, they want they want to customize their home. They want you know a lot of people coming here with disposable income, and they want statement pieces. They want something that's unique that they can say I had custom built. Yeah. And our price points, you know, I don't. I'm not doing them, uh, you know, price points where things are just astronomical. My whole thing was is that, you know, if they can go to Ashley Furniture and spend seven thousand on, on a table, then you know I can build them a table for seven thousand dollars. I can still make them a very good living. Yep. Um, and they can get something that you know they've never had in life, which is a custom piece, and that can be something they is an heirloom quality that they can keep. Yeah, and a lot of that heirloom quality <laughs> furniture <clears throat> I've talked about. A lot of that heirloom quality furniture comes from wood that tree services would a lot of times dispose of which is just it's awesome to be able to yeah. take something like that and turn it into a seven thousand dollar piece of table it's amazing yeah and we have some that uh, we had a guy last year he brought in um some cross cuts from a large pecan tree that uh grandma planted 90 years ago and the tree grandma died a few years ago they had four cross cuts so about I don't know, six inches thick and about 40 inches around. And the tree had started encroaching upon the original house, so they had to cut it down. Well, they have been sitting in their garages. They didn't know or couldn't find anybody who could do anything with it or process it. So he brought it to us, and we turned into a large coffee table and then a, a, lar a large, uh, like a card table, like a four top. And then we took the remaining amount and turned it into cutting boards for the rest of the family. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, everybody has a piece of something to remember grandma by. Yeah. You know, so we run into a lot of situations like that where they've got this stuff they've had for a while, or, you know, and they're just, or, you know, we, I've managed to upgrade to the current shop I have, you know, I've got three phase equipment now, which is a big reason why I moved, uh, so I could have bigger machines. So we've got a 52 inch planer uh, belt sander combo unit. Oh, so wow. it's a three head machine, 52 inches wide, it'll plane and then sanding with two, two different sanding heads, that's what spits it out at 180. Um, and so, and we got 24 inch double sided planer. So, you know, being able to process and a straight line rip saw and panel saws and band saws and all this stuff, we stay busy with just millwork on a regular basis. Where guys are coming in, they're, they're doing their own, <clears throat> we're servicing other makers in the area, they're working on their garages. They'll do an epoxy table that's 30 something inches wide or 40 inches wide. And I don't know if you've ever used a router sled. Yeah. That, that may get it level, but it sure is a lot of work getting it pretty after that because of all the <laughs> and everything else. And it's, yeah. it's no ordeal. So we just charge a flat 150 bucks. They'll bring in a thing straight out the mold. We'll run the machine in 10 minutes and it's perfect. No brainer. The amount yeah, of time so, they're going to save running that router sled. And then, like you said, going through all the different grits on sandpaper to get it looking good. It's like. Especially with resin. It's not yeah. fun. To see. Yeah. Um, so where, you know, I've made it a point to, um, service all my competition and you know and my whole thing was is that you know no matter how great i am i'm never going to be able to get every customer in the area and yeah. I, I don't have the, i won't be able to have the place big enough and no matter how great i'm not everybody's going to use me and they're not going to not everybody's going to like what i do yeah but if i can be on the supply side and the support side for everybody else in the area which i am i get a little piece of everything that's smart because when those guys are making tables they're coming to me to have, help them process them or because we have a retail in our, you know, we're selling a resin and epoxy and tools. We're a saw stop dealer now. Uh, so I'm trying to, and I've told every one of my commercial customers, and look, you know, if there's something you're getting and you're having to order it, let me know what it is. I'll stock it for you. I'll make sure it's cheaper than you're buying it on Amazon or wherever you're getting. Yeah. And we'll supply you and it'll be here in stock whenever you need it. Hmm. You know? That's smart. Uh, we're, you know, so we're trying to be on, you know, with every, every bit of the side I can get, if I can be on the supply side, the retail side, the maker side, I figure if I've got all those baskets, if one slows down, the other one keeps up. And I tell know, guys that all the time. The as I can. And then um, about four years ago, I started a woodworking club in our area, which we didn't have, and I host it here. Uh, we have about 40 or 50 members that come in every month. And we host that. I charge $35 a year for the club. And we do how-tos and classes and occasional guest speakers and stuff and oh, that's awesome. contests and give away uh, money and stuff and help build a community around this place 
Mm -hmm. And we give discounts to the guys that are in the club. And, um, you know, and I help them with, you know, they can call me up and send me pictures and say, hey, you know, I'm I'm stuck on this thing here. I'm trying to do this. What do you think I should do? And sometimes I give them good advice. Other times I ain't got a clue. And other times I tell them they're kind of screwed. <laughs> <laughs> Start over and chunking his firewood now. I mean, you just never know. But um, I, I believe a rising tide lifts all ships. So I just try to support everybody around me. And the good thing, the good things are coming back as a result. Yeah, it sounds like. You're, you're running a business. You're very smart and uh, being vertically integrated. I talk with guys about that all the time. If you have multiple revenue streams, when one slows down, one usually picks up and that helps even out the ups and downs of the market and the economy. Uh, boy, would your uh, woodworking group ever be interested in a wood drying lesson or uh, seminar from yours truly? I could fly in and... Um, hang out at your shop and maybe invite yeah, people to do to that. Check. We're always looking for guest speakers. That would be yeah. fun. Um, a lot of the guys don't understand what is the process and how it works and all that stuff. Yeah. And to your point about in different sources of income, um, I believe it was, I heard a speech with Warren Buffett um, years ago. And he said, you know, if you have seven sources of income, you'll always be lucky. Yeah. And I, yeah. <laughs> and I took that to heart. I was like, okay, well, don't have all your eggs in one basket. You know, if you've got, yeah. you got seven different sources, even if they're the same industry, he says, you know, some up or some are down, but you know, yeah, you always have something coming. Yep. Yep. That's right. Like even smaller guys who don't have everything that you have, you obviously have a great setup employees. If you can add slab flattening to your business, that's another thing that can keep you a little bit busy. That's why uh, drying is a good, uh, another income source or if you make Good. furniture and sell lumber just the more value adds that you can do i have even you know if you want to be the source for people to buy um finishing products like you said uh you can get set up as a vendor for some of that stuff for a pretty affordable price and just make a little bit of money on that on the side well, yeah i've looked into that uh we've got approval from uh rubio uh uh, tried and true. Uh, we got. Uh, we're with. Uh, um, what was it? Um, Odie's. And the, the only difficult part about that, even for me, is um, you know there, there's a certain there's minimum orders. Yeah. You know, for if I if I want to be a Rubio dealer, I got to spend about five grand up front. Yeah. And I have a whole lot of Rubio in stock. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, and of course, my thing is like, well, that's a lot of darn Rubio. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, if I want to have that much Rubio in stock, I'll have limited space. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, and and to, and also that is that you know a lot of the retail stuff there's really like you know a 20, 25 percent markup. Yeah. So you're not getting rich off of selling finishes and stuff. So really, the only finish I carry right now is tried and true, which is a really it's a wipe on varnish. There's a Danish oil, and then there's a um, an organic one for doing cutting boards and stuff. Yeah. And it's, I carry that because anybody can apply it. It's simple. It's easy. Yep. You don't need special tools. And if you do your prep work right and you're sanding right, uh, it'll look great, you know, for yeah. non-high wear items. Uh, there's other options for that. But, you know, and I can order stuff for them. Um, but, you know, I, people ask me, well, what finish should I use for this project? So, well, what finish are you good at using? Yeah. Well, I've been doing this for years and it works great. I said, well, then that's the finish you should use. Yeah. Um, if, you've do it, if you're doing something and it's working, I mean, there's seven ways to do everything, yeah. but if you found something that works for you and you're getting good results, you know, stick you with it. Yes, yeah, stick with it. You know, learn something else that's going to benefit you more. So since you're making a lot of custom furniture uh, for recently and for new houses, have you seen any design trends in the live edge world? I know that like the really colorful river table epoxy pours is that going out and people are going for just more of a, a simple black to fill the voids and letting more more wood what do you see for like a uh, so uh, i have one competitor in the area but we you know we work together and actually help each other now and uh, they buy stuff from us and i do finish work for them and they do some epoxy bigger epoxy pours for me because well, i do do resin work i've done some big pours but my shop isn't uh friendly for doing clear pours because of all the dust yeah um so you know if i'm doing a two inch deep pour on a 10 foot table you know i can't shut down the rest of my shop for for a day to have it dust free to keep that clear pour so a lot of times i'll sub that out to him because he's got a whole room 
and, then, and then that's primarily their deals. They do epoxy all day. That's they do a lot of epoxy tables, and that's their business. And so I kind of I work on what I work on. I let them do the most stuff, and then I, we do a lot of crack filling and knots and you know splits and checks at the ends and stuff like that. Is primarily the most of the resin work I do. Sometimes there's colors, um, and I do a lot of stuff with the CNC with inlays with resin. Um, the bigger pours of stuff I kind of leave to them because they're better set up for it. Yeah. And, um, one thing I have learned about this business is, you know, you can't do everything great. You yeah. can't be set up for everything great. Like I, I don't do cabinetry. That's a whole different shop setup than what I'm doing. You know, it requires a lot more space to assemble and everything else. And it's, if you're going to be competitive, you've got to really have some big machinery. Um, otherwise you're just doing ready to assemble. But um so with, I've seen to answer your question clearly on that, the trends I'm seeing with the resin stuff is um, my competitor is doing more of like clear stuff with things inlaid in them, seashells and shark's teeth and bullets and memorabilia and stuff that's personal to them. Um, I did a quote for, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of Gloria Gaynor, I Will Survive. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah so she, um, I met her recently. She came in the shop and she had a box with her about a shoe box and she's in her 70s or 80s now and she's been all over the place for 30 years 40 years for singing maybe longer i don't know but um she had apparently stolen the room key to every hotel she stayed at all over the world <laughs> i'm not I'm kidding so she had a stack of digital cards like that and in the box there's some with like tassels on them and big skeleton keys and ones from Germany and Poland and all over the world. It was really cool. And so what I talked to her was about making this a uh, smaller table and then having uh, her favorite keys from each region inlaid in a table with a map of the world. Yeah. So a wood map of the world pick, cut out with CNC. Okay. See back, you know, blue sea background, you know, the, the, uh, the major cities where, where they, they were kind of, you know, written in them with the CNC. Um, and then a, you know, either a string or a line or that key placed near that in the resin. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Having the whole border inlaid with the, the card keys, you know, of it just to kind of represent, you know, a map of where she had been throughout her life entertaining. Wow. It, was, it, was a, it was a super cool idea we came up with. And um, she hasn't pulled the trigger on it yet, but, you know, yes. it was a good idea. But so, you, you know, it's just things like that I see more often that have personal meaning or a reference to them Yeah, um, are, are much more prevalent than just someone wanting a blue river table. Yeah. Um, and I'm seeing, I don't see a lot of uh, sports stuff. So we're not seeing like a, you know, a Clemson Tigers table or a Steelers table or stuff like that. Um, and, you know, I've, I've got customers ask, well, you know, what color do you think I should do in there? I said, Honestly, I would do like a smoke black or a black. And they're like, well, why do you say that? I said, well, let's say you do a blue or an orange or a red. I said, what happens if you change your decor in your home? Yeah, exactly. Sort of five years, 10 years down the road, you're not so hot on that blue anymore. Yeah. I said, smoked or a smoked black or, or a black. I said, it's kind of neutral, mm -hmm. it's classy. You know, if you got some spalting in the wood or a lot of woods already have some black in it. So it kind of lends itself personally i think better to um you know to a lot of uh, higher end projects I, I agree i think uh more of the classy higher end stuff from what i'm seeing and i go and visit customer shops that's what they're opting for something black that's neutral and it makes your eye focus on the wood itself and not the plastic epoxy so Absolutely. um just a message out there for our customers who listen to this maybe you know, start looking at popular designs and stuff like that. And, you know, I do encourage everybody to go to your website. Is it uh, dcwhardwoods.com or? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And we're on so all the social media stuff, every one of them. Facebook, um, Instagram. Do you do the social them. media stuff yourself or do you have somebody that helps? I did initially. I, one of my employees does it. Uh, nice. She does. Uh, she is. She does a better job of making sure things get posted where I'm yeah. too busy working a lot of times. Yeah. So a lot of times it's, you know, and, and anybody who's got a small business, I mean, you wear a lot of hats and you're constantly go, go, go. And one minute so you're doing many. this, one minute you're doing that. And, you know, and, and my most common saying in the shop is what was I doing? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you're constantly getting interrupted. And that's one of the things I dislike about 
my current situation is I don't get to do as much working as I would like to do. I do a lot of teaching and supervising and coaching. Uh, you know, for example, we're doing a carved table, um, really unique table um, for this client. It's very expensive. Um, I'll, I'll pull it up in just a second, but and in one spot, we used some dominoes to put it together, and then we had to carve everything back. Well, the problem was we used a beach domino and a walnut piece, and when we carved to it, it exposed the domino. Okay. And we had to carve out the domino and then cut in a piece to insert there. When I went over with my, my maker that works for me, it's okay. You know, we're gonna take it. We're gonna make a plug, same grain direction, all that stuff as this area. You take the plug and you're going to trace it out with a marking knife where that plug's going to go, and then you're going to hollow that out. And then we're going to insert the plug in there and glue it in and sand it back to fill that area and grain match as best we can. Yeah. Um, so he did that. He's like, Yeah, yeah, I got it. Sure, no problem. And I came back about an hour later. I'm like, You don't got to do it. He's like, No. <laughs> <laughs> so he was having a hard time with it. And he had pulled out a multi tool instead of a chisel. I'm like, Oh my God, no. Uh, you know, the vibrating multi-tools? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was like, put that away. I said, don't yeah. ever put anywhere near anything that requires joiner or tight joints. So it's, yeah. it's a vibrating tool. It's not going to be <laughs> so, I was, so I went over there and I was showing them. And then I was like, look, I said, stop what you're doing here. Take a break. Get your wits about you. Get your patience yeah. back. Go get some scrap and practice on a few pieces before we come back to this. And I went and I fixed the piece and did it. And then, but there's another spot that needs to be done too. So, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, even in a production setting, you still have to say, okay, let's get sit back, go practice it a few times, then go back and attack it. Yeah. And it's okay, it's okay to screw up. You know, you just, you know, everybody screws up. I think the only difference between professionals and amateurs is that a professional knows how to cover it up. <laughs> yeah. uh, an amateur is just like, oh no, I got to start over. Whereas professionals like, yep, you know what, I got this. And yeah, this, 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 and boom, it's gone. Only the guy who did it knows it's there. Yeah, you know. So you remind me of, uh, I had a buddy that was a head mechanic at a shop and his job, he was kind of the same way. He's like, he didn't get to do much mechanic work, but he would go around and mentor and kind of somebody gets themselves in a bind. He'd go over and do the same thing, kind of talk them through it, yeah. uh, teach them how he would fix it. So yeah, it seems like that's where you're at right now is, uh, and that's really what it is. It's, it's, you know, I, I get each, um, so this is real quick the yep. piece we're working on oh wow look at that thing holy smokes the coffee table now that's all out of solid walnut wow so you can imagine the challenges of figuring out the angles and how to do that from a picture try to make it look like that i can't even imagine exactly like that oh that's wild so anyway so that table on the um website in europe is twelve thousand dollars yeah so uh and believe me when you get into it you start building it and you start doing it, a lot of power carving and stuff and shaping and, and laminating and stuff you know the hours are there we've got about 50 hours into it now well that's so cool. you know we're on the tail end of it and it's all put together and we've now we're just fixing a few spots and it'll probably be ready in about a week or two we got to get the custom glass cut for the inlay hey, well hey thank you joey for taking the time to sit down with me and uh chat about dcw hardwoods what a cool story uh look forward to following you guys some more and seeing what you guys do next